turn to start in Exodus chapter 17. We're going to be reading together, and we're going to be leading up to this point and kind of doing a little bit of a backtrack. All right, so in Exodus chapter 17, we have come through 16 last Sunday morning, but at Sunday nights, we've come out of Egypt, and so they've gotten free of Egypt. The, the Israelites were there, they were, they were captive, they were slaves, they were set free by God, they wander down through the peninsula, they cross over the Red Sea, they come to the bitter springs of Mara. They come to the wilderness of sin where God feeds them with the manna. And here we are now in, uh, in Rephidim. And so let's read. I'm going to read the whole chapter, 16 verses, and then we will take off. So verse 1 of Exodus 17. Then all the congregation of the children of Israel set out on their journey uh, from the wilderness of sin according to the commandment of the Lord and camped at, in Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. Therefore the people contended with Moses and said, Give us water that we may drink. So Moses said to them, Why do you contend with me? Why do you tempt the Lord? And the people thirsted there for water. And the people complained against Moses and said, Why is this you brought us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? So Moses cried out to the Lord saying, What shall I do with this people? They are almost ready to stone me. And the Lord said to Moses, Go on before the people and take with you some of the elders of Israel. Also take in your hand the rod which you struck the river and go. Behold, I will stand before you there on the rock in Horeb, and you shall strike the rock, and water will come out of it, and the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. So he called the name of the place Massa and Meribah, because of the contention of the children of Israel, and because they tempted the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? Now uh, Amalek came and fought with Israel in Rephidim. And Moses said to Joshua, Choose some men and go out and fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on top of the hill with the rod of God in my hand. So Joshua did as Moses said to him and fought with Amalek. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up on the top of the hill. And so it was when Moses held up his hand that Israel prevailed, and when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands became heavy. So they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it, and Aaron and Hur supported his hands, one on one side and the other on the other side. And his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. So Joshua defeated Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. Then the Lord said to Moses, write this for a memorial in the book and recount it in the hearing of Joshua that I will utterly blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. And Moses built an altar and called its name, the Lord is my banner. For he said, because the Lord has sworn, the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. Let's pray one more time. Lord God, your word is full of lessons. It is full of instruction. It is full of comfort and hope and peace and joy. And it can bring all these things to us, God. But God, I pray that we would have hearts and ears that would hear from you today. I pray, God, that you bless your people here as we gather and we go through your word. God, I pray that you help me through all of this. God, I've done my best <laughs> to prepare this, God, but I am the weakest link in this factor here, God, that your word and your spirit is where the power lies. And so, God, I pray that you speak through me. I pray that we all have ears to hear, and I pray that every single person would walk away as blessed from this chapter, God, as you have blessed me this week. And so, God, be with us. Show yourself strong on our behalf. And Lord, change us. Conform us to the image of your son and bring us into that sweet place of fellowship with you. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. So as we look at our text today, um, I did something a little different than normal. Uh, in my adding some Bible verses, I even actually put some of my points or some of my main thoughts down. And I actually, so I title all the messages, but I don't normally talk about what I ended up titling them, but this was God's plan for victory. We're going to see 
a, a bunch of things that have actually led up to chapter 17 and then take place through chapter 17. And this chapter is actually like a really big deal. And we're going to get to that at the very end, but it's a big deal. Things that are go on here are a big deal, and God thinks it's a big deal. And I think God would want every single believer to know the lessons that are to be learned through this chapter. And so as we look in verse 1, it says, Then all the congregation of the children of Israel, they set out on a journey from the wilderness of sin according to the commandment of the Lord. And so first and foremost, before anything else, is just the one simple point that God led them there. That's just my first point, is that they are exactly where God wants them. God led them to this place where this battle is about to take place. They were not wandering. They were obeying the Lord, and it wasn't, um, it was God's intent. And if you look at everything that's led up to this point, they've continued to experience all of these experiences, but every moment of the way, every step, God has led them. And so it's just to remember that God will lead us into these situations because it says, but there was no water. God led them to the place with no water. And they got exactly where God wanted them to be. Now in verses 2 through 7, it, it's a real straightforward account that the people come, they want water, they're complaining to Moses. Moses is like, guys, this isn't between you and me, this is between you guys and God. You know, I, ever, I always just wonder how those conversations went. Like, Moses, why'd you lead me out here? And what's Moses is like, do you see the cloud? <laughs> do you see the pillar of fire? I led you out here? We're following a gigantic pillar of fire, people. This is not my doing, you know? He wasn't there with his staff coaxing the pillar to move left or move right. He's like, we're just following God, and here's where we are. And so he cries out to God, what do I do with these people, Lord? He just cries out, Lord. And I don't know how often you cry out to the Lord about your work or your family or whoever. <laughs> what do I do with these people, Lord? What do I do with my in-laws? Or what do I do with my parents, my own parents, right? Or my children? What, do I, what am I supposed to do with these people? And God gives them the instructions. And we're not spending a lot of time in verses 1 through 7 because uh, later on when the rock is smitten for the second time, there'll be a great teaching to go along with that. But as we see, though, he takes them to the rock out here in Rephidim, they're not quite to Sinai yet. He hits it with his rod, and water gushes forth. And for those who stay for the video or have seen footage like this before, the, the rock that they propose is this rock. Again, we don't know for certain, but I think there's some strong evidence that points that way. It is not, you see pictures, right? Again, me attacking all the children's books. I hate the children's books where they, you know, the, the, the ark with like the giraffe head and the lion head. It's like, you can't fit thousands of animals on that thing. You got to drive, you got to make a big boat, like a real ark, like the Bible. Well, I don't know if you've ever seen pictures where it's like this like little trickling spring, you know, coming out. There's like two million people. This is not a little trickle, trickle, trickle. Look what I did. I poked a hole on a rock. No, no, no. This rock they show is actually about two to three stories tall. It is cleaved in half and everything coming down from it in the desert where there is no rain, there's actually water erosion, very definite water erosion on all the rocks leading down. This would have gushed forth a gigantic little lake that two million people could have gathered around and drank from. And so this is the rock. Now, last week, we read out of 1 Corinthians 10. And you don't need to flip there with me because I just want to highlight two things. But at the beginning of 1 Corinthians 10, we read about how these things are, are examples for us. Verse 2, it says that all were baptized into the sea so that going through the Red Sea is symbolic of baptism. They ate the same spiritual food, verse 3 and verse 4, right? They all drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that, flowed, that followed them, and that rock was Christ. And so the New Testament, the best commentary on the Bible being the Bible, it tells us this rock is symbolic of Jesus. So we know that. Some things are symbolic, and it takes a little study, but other things the Bible says, this is symbolic of Jesus Christ, this rock here in the desert. But now, verses 11 through 13, in the same section, same paragraph of text written by Paul of the Corinthians, all these things happened as examples. They were written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the ages have come. So this rock... 
And this story in the Old Testament was written to be an example for us. And then how does he cl- close this thought? He closes by saying, Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. No temptation is overtaking you such as common to man, but God is faithful, right? Who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with every temptation will also make a way of escape that you may bear it. I believe that as we move out of this water from the rock into this next battle, we're going to see a picture of what all Christians face, and that is the battle within. And there are two battles we face. There is the battle within, and there's the battle without, right? On the outside, it's spiritual warfare. It is fighting against the enemy, right? We do not fight against flesh and blood, but against angels, principalities, and powers. We fight against those things. But there is always that battle on the inside. And if you look at verse 8, we have Amalek. Amalek came. Immediately after the water comes from the rock, Amalek shows up and fought with Israel in Rephidim. Now, Amalek in the Bible is very consistently, every time you see these mentions of Amalek, it plays this beautiful picture of the flesh, the flesh, the inside part of me. Though though I am born again, I'm a new creation, I'm still stuck in this body. I've still got this thing that I have to lug around, and it's not spiritual, and it has its own needs, its own desires, and I have to deal with it all the time. God has a way of dealing with the flesh. He tells us, annihilate it, destroy it, be done with it. Don't let it live. And as Roberta just prayed, right, my father is is going through a battle with cancer. The reason he's doing radiation treatments now is because his flesh, cancer is a rebellion of the flesh. It's truly what it is. It's where things growing and start, and it just spreads. And because when they did the surgery, they didn't get every last cancer cell out it is now coming back and it's attacking him and the amalekites throughout the whole bible god says it's this is a battle you're gonna have to fight it but the the goal is to eliminate it be done with it and don't leave a single speck of it the most i think memorable other story in the bible is in first samuel 15 where saul is called fight against the amalekites but destroy them kill everything everything yeah everything even the animals. I want you to get rid of it. Every last bit, don't let it live. And what what does Saul do? He lets the king live, some of the royal family, some to-do people of good stature may be useful. They're smart. He lets, he kills most of the sheep, the ugly ones and the dumb ones and the whatever, but he he keeps the nice one, he keeps the good-looking oxen. Well, I was going to sacrifice these to the Lord. And Samuel just, no. You didn't get it, do you, Saul? You were supposed to annihilate them. And just like Moses will be kicked out of the promised land because he will strike the rock again. And God's like, you just misrepresented me. And that was supposed to be an important picture there. Saul was supposed to utterly annihilate the flesh. And he didn't obey. And he gets, God's mad. Because like, that was a picture you were supposed to be fulfilling for me. I was trying to teach a lesson. These stories are going to be useful someday, Saul. And here's how it ends. So Samuel said, has the Lord great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices, as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than to sacrifice, and to heed than the fat of rams, for rebellion is the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. And because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected you from being king. Saul loses his kingdom because of his disobedience, because God was trying to make an important, important point. Amalek's a picture of the flesh. He's like, I want you to be done with the flesh, get rid of the flesh, have, make no provision for the flesh. And before we move on to the next verse, I, I want to throw this out because this is something I left out last week. And I felt so stupid when I did because like, this was one of the most important points. Last week when we looked at the manna from heaven, we looked at that daily bread, that they had to come to the Lord daily to seek his provision, to seek his filling because if they went, they, 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 they couldn't hang on. I can't go to church and get fed on Sunday and expect by Wednesday to still feel that without going and getting and gathering again. That daily, I have to go and gather from the Lord. And this really is symbolic of that devotional time we spend. And we looked at the early morning. If they didn't gather the manna in the early morning, it melted away. They had to get it while the getting was good. 
And I forgot to mention this important thing, the significance of devotions and our struggle with the flesh and our struggle with sin. Here's the tie-in. The Amalekites came and they fought. They came in, but who did they come? And we've got to flip to Deuteronomy to find out who was the most vulnerable to attack. Who were the ones that Israel was being attacked? And in Deuteronomy, the Lord says, remember what Amalek did to you on the way as you were coming out of Egypt. We're in Deuteronomy 25, 17 and 18 for my note takers. But he says, what they do to you? How he met you on the way and he attacked your rear ranks. All the stragglers at your rear when you were tired and weary and he did not fear God. You see, when Amalek came to attack, he didn't go after head on Israel. It wasn't like some movie scene where there's the, the lion of Amalek ready for the battle. More than likely, I, I mean, I can imagine on the map, I don't know if you have the map there, but if they cross at the southern point of the Sinai Peninsula and they were moving north into Rephidim, Amalek would have just swooped around from behind them. I guess for you guys to be this way on a map following them up north to Rephidim, and they were taking out the stragglers. They were taking out the weak ones. But guys, here's the sim- symbolism here is, on Sunday nights, we talked about how the desert in the daytime is very hot, and at night, it's very cold. Yet in the daytime, God was a pillar of cloud. And if you stayed near the cloud, you would be in its shade and in its comfort. And at the nighttime, when it was cold, If you drew near to the pillar of fire, you would have heat. And if you just stay close to the Lord, he would guide you, he'd provide for you, he would comfort you. But there are those who begin to straggle, and it's the distancing from the Lord. The ones who are in the back are the furthest from the cloud. The ones who are in the back are the furthest from God. Some straggle because they just never maybe got the habit of getting up to the front. Others, it's different reasons. I'll tell you what. It is really easy when you've been serving the Lord for a season or two to say, you know what? I've taught that Bible study before. I don't need to go to it. And you know what? I've done this and I've done that. And I'm serving in all these ministries. And somehow we can replace our alone time with God with things. And all of a sudden, though, we find ourselves a little further and a little further behind. I remember my friend when I was young in the faith always would say, it's the days I don't want to go to church. He goes, those are the days I know I have to go. I hear the same thing about the gym, you know? It's just the idea. It's like, it's the days you're fighting it. That, no, I need to show up on those days. Those are the days I need to be there. I need to be getting my fill. And so these stragglers are being attacked. And I think the flesh, that's how it works. When you're close to the Lord, it helps keep the flesh at bay. But the ones who are straggling behind, it's what happens. The flesh comes up out of nowhere And it gets them. Now, verse 9, it says, Moses said to Joshua, choose some men and go out and fight Amalek. Okay? Here's an interesting thought. What did Israel have to do for the plagues to come in Egypt? They did nothing, right? I mean, God did that. How did Israel part the sea? They did nothing. God took care of the parting of the sea. And you think of the pictures here, right? The Passover lamb, salvation, God alone. They were baptized through the Red Sea. It's, a, it's an act of God, right? Recognizing that transformation. God provided the manna. God provides the water from the rock. And without turning to John 4, most of us know the story of the woman at the well in John 4. And he says, right, but I can give you living waters. I'll give you waters that will never cease. And Jesus being a picture of the rock, this being the living water that comes from the rock. So here we see provision of the Holy Spirit, of God's word and his fellowship. I will give you all these things. And then Amalek shows up, and God says, that's your battle. You have to fight the flesh. I will save you. I will continue to work to sanctify you. I'll provide for you. I'll give you all these tools and all these things. But truly, the battle against the flesh is something we have to fight. He gives us tools. He enables us. He protects us. He guides us supernaturally, but it is our battle, and Israel had to man up and grab swords. And you know what? They questioned God at the Red Sea, but God got them through it. They questioned him at Marah, but he made the bitter waters sweet. They questioned him at the wilderness of sin, but he provided manna. They questioned him at Rephidim, at the rock, but he provided water. Praise God. There's not one mention Get a sword. It's time to fight. Maybe Israel finally got it. All right. It's time to fight. 
And I ask God, and I know I'm the only one here, right? Why do I seem to still struggle with the same sins? Why is it that I'm still prone to do the same things? I know I'm not the only one. But it's that idea of, Lord, why, why am I still struggling with anger again and again? Why, why is it greed? Why is it pride? Why is it lust? Why is it addiction? And it seems like, why do, these little temp- why do you always let the little temptations come? I mean, that's, I think, my big complaint sometimes. Lord, why can't you just, you could just make those never happen again, right? You could just take them all away supernaturally. That image would never pop up on the computer. Supernaturally, I'd never walk by that aisle in the supermarket. Supernaturally, I'd never have that friend come around. He's like, this is your battle. And the thing is, is those little battles along the way where they were learning to trust God and they were learning to trust God. And then again, they doubted, but they trusted. Then they doubted, then they trusted. And finally, here when the battle battle came, it was all those little fights along the way, all those little things that they had to struggle through. God led them there so they'd be ready for this. Now when the big battle of the flesh takes place, they grabbed, they drew arms, and they went out there. So God doesn't fight this battle. Israel had to fight it. He helped them supernaturally. But they were the ones out there with the swords. God will help you supernaturally, but he's expecting you to armor up and get out there and do it. And I just want to encourage you guys, if you ever struggle with this wrestling with the flesh, if you wrestle with the flesh, know that you're on track. Charles Spurgeon said, dead men don't wrestle. Dead men don't wrestle. Before we were saved and we were dead in our sins, there was no wrestling. I just sinned. But now I wrestle. Now when the temptation comes, I have to fight with that. I have to get it away from me and I have to seek the Holy Spirit, seek the Lord, and I have to to go on with life. And I personally do struggle. I know people who say, well, I haven't sinned in in eight years. You just did, bro. That's a lie. (laughs) Can I ask your wife that question? You know, and that's, but the thing is, is people say that. And that's discouraging if you're struggling. When someone tells you, well, I haven't, you know, I haven't done this in forever. Okay, there's a guy named Paul the Apostle, and maybe you've heard of him, cool guy. He wrote Romans 7, he wrote Galatians 5. Those are the chapters to go read about wrestling with the flesh. That Galatians 5, it describes the flesh for us, so we know this idea of what the flesh is and the works of the flesh, that we should not practice such things. Practice makes perfect, you know. It's the people who live in those things and just continue to do them and practice them. That's an issue. The people who struggle with them, that just shows you have a, a, a heartbeat going on, that you're struggling with stuff. You're alive, and thus you wrestle. Romans 7, oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of sin and death? Why is it, right, that I do the things that I know I ought not to do, and I'm not doing the things that I know I ought to do? That's Paul. And so it comforts me when I see Paul struggle with stuff. And I've probably said it a thousand times to you guys, but Romans 7, you know what the most comforting thing of Romans 7 is? Not one of you has a single clue what he wrestled with. And because of that, it's the exact same thing you wrestle with. If you struggle with lust, you can read Romans 7 and wonder, you know, he might struggle with lust. You struggle with addiction? Paul could have struggled with addiction. Paul could have struggled with pride, with gambling, with who knows what. But that's the thing. If Paul wrestled, then I know that if I'm wrestling, I'm, I'm doing okay. As long as I'm wrestling. If I quit wrestling, that's a problem. And so we don't just want to, to know that this is going to happen. We want to see a way through this, right? This is, now let's get to the part where we start seeing what's the answer, what's the cure, what's the fix. How do I win the battle against the flesh? And, and so verses 10 to 12 The biggest key to this battle, the biggest key to this battle was the prayer and intercession taking place up on the hillside. Joshua did as Moses said in verse 10, but then Moses, Aaron, and Hur go up on the hill. And so it was, and Moses held up his hands. 1 Timothy 2.8, that all men everywhere would lift up their hands, the holy hands. I, I think that's less worship, and truly, that was a thing of prayer back then. My pastor in Ellensburg would always raise his hand when he would pray passionately. He'd lift up his hand and pray. It's an act of prayer. And he says he, he lifted his hands up. And whenever he had those hands up, Israel prevailed. But when he let them down, Amalek prevailed. 
when you lift up your hands in prayer, you will see that you will prevail in this fight against the flesh. When you're continually lifting things up in prayer, not just, oh Lord, take it away one time, why haven't you taken away, but continually. I've asked God before for too, Lord, do you just not take this away so I keep coming back? I've honestly sometimes heard the, I kind of like it when you come back. It's nice to see you again. I might just send some more trial your way. <laughs> That's what it takes to bring you on home and have a conversation with me. And so here they're, they're, they're praying, and prayer changes things. Prayer has power. Prayer, prayer does things, right? James 5.16, confess your trespasses to one another. This is the body of Christ. Stop and just think for a moment if you've actually confessed any trespasses to anyone in this room or another brother and sister in Christ, because this is not a suggestion, right? These are commands. It's the Bible. Confess them to one another and then pray for one another that you may be healed. You see the connection there? No confessy fessy, no healy healy. That's just how the thing works. If you, if you don't find someone whom you trust, who you can at least even say, I just need help in this area. You don't need to pour out every detail. They don't want to hear every detail. I don't want to hear every detail. That can be stumbling. But just to say, I need prayer, and I need it in general. Struggling with the flesh is good enough. And the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. It does make a difference. Prayer makes a difference. And when we're praying, we're doing well. When we're not praying, you're going to find us fall away and struggle. Great quote, I've quoted before. No man is greater than his prayer life. The pastor who's not praying is playing. The people who are not praying are straying. We have many organizers, but few agonizers. Many players, but few, and payers, but few prayers. Many singers, but few clingers. Lots of pastors, few wrestlers. Many fears, few tears. Much fashion, little passion. Many interferers, few intercessors. Many writers, but few fighters. Failing here, we the church, we fail everywhere. I like Ravenhill. I just, I quote him a lot. He's always that prophetic punch in the gut that I need sometimes to set me back on track and just make me realize what I need to do. I like this. A sinning man will stop praying, and a praying man will stop sinning. That's like the, the equal and parallel to John Bunyan's, right? That this book will keep me from sin, or sin will keep me from this book. A sinning man will stop praying, and a praying man will stop sinning. And these are true, true, true things. And I will say this to you as well. That devotional time, going back to that devotional time from last week, I have never been able to maintain successful and actually worthwhile devotions with God, intimate devotion time, while I know I have had unconfessed sin. And it could be as simple as, as I was rude to someone and I needed to say I'm sorry. And I've tried praying, Lord, can I get to it tomorrow? And it's just like dead silence on the, hello, God, you were there yesterday, don't hear you anymore. And he, I feel absent. I feel absent from the Lord. I feel like I can't hear that he's there because he deals with us. But here's the thing with praying like that, true prayer, real deep prayer, is that true prayer is exhausting. True intercession, it can truly be. Now, I'm not saying every time you pray, you're going to walk away sweating, right? But you see, real intercession, really getting into it, it can be difficult. See, Jesus says, as he began to spoke a parable, but he started by saying, I, I desire that men always ought to pray and not lose heart. But that lose heart, right? In, in, the, in the old King James, it was grow faint. And I actually think that's better because uh, ekakeo in the Greek, that word for lose heart, one word in the Greek, to be utterly spiritless, being emptied of spirit, to be wearied out, to be exhausted. Jesus would not say pray and don't grow faint if it was impossible to grow faint in prayer. He wouldn't say pray and don't grow faint if that would not be a natural side effect of praying with fervency. He prayed and he sweat blood because he prayed fervently and he prayed with a passion. You see, in bounds, I had asked Kyle to remind me of the verse that kind of, or the section of a book that kind of really helped waken him up, I think. 
is the very essence of prayer is the spirit of devotion. Without devotion, prayer is an empty form a vain round of words. It is easy just to say prayers. Saying prayers is not praying. Saying our prayers is not praying. And this is just an encouragement. I'm thinking I'm going to go on a, a kick here where at least once every Sunday morning, I got to have one exhortation to the husbands or to the parents because we need our leaders and who are influencers to really be able to pass these on. And you can feel free to tell a husband or a father this, but something I try, I try, I'm human still, to do in our home is pray with my children, but not just say prayers with my children, because more is caught than taught. And just think about this for a second. If you have any little children that ever hear you pray, and I don't want to shame anyone, because I've done done the same thing, but, well, God, thank you for this food, and uh, thank you for this day, and we just thank you, God, amen. You have just taught your children how to pray. That that is what prayer looks like. And I try with my kids. I try. I say, Lord, bless this food. Thank you that mommy made it. But, and God, help mommy and daddy be good parents. Help us be able to teach Judah and Jubilee and Benny how to be good kids and help how th- we can help them learn to obey you. And God, help us to obey you. They don't have to be lengthy. But to hear kids having their parents pray for wisdom on how to parent them, that's a, it's something different than just saying prayers. I'm praying with my kids. Pray with me before bed. And there are times when I do short prayers, and I don't kick myself for that because sometimes life happens, right? But at the same time, I make sure that on a regular basis, my kids hear me pray, not just say prayers. And to pray with a, without devotion, it is, it's just words. Imagine if your kid came up and asked you, you know, Hey, Dad, you want to buy me a car? Say what? Ah, well, whatever. And walk off. Well, you'd blow that off. You know, but you've had a teenage boy who's coming at you week after week. You still might make him work, right? But it's like, Dad, can, could you please give me a car? Because, you know, I'm going to that school. It's across town, and the buses don't run that way, and it, it would just make life easier. I'd be able to drive the other kids. And God, please, would you, Dad, I'm saying Dad, Father, would you give me a, would you help me get a car? Could you... And when Jesus, as he tells us, knocking persistently, right, he commends that. Just keep coming back, and Lord, I want this, and here's the reason why, and God, I I want you to be glorified, and here's how you'd be glorified if you answer this prayer. Not, Dad, could I have the car? Would you buy me one? It's that devotion, and God's looking for our hearts. He's looking for our hearts, and that can be exhausting. And Moses, he became weak. His hands couldn't support it anymore. And he wasn't so proud that he just stood there as his hands were drooping down, and Aaron, little bro, do you have that? I got this, and his arms are going down, you know. You sure? Yep. Because we all need brothers to hold us up, and that's the other thing in 10 to 12. We all need an Aaron and a her. We need men if you're a man. I liked I put on Facebook, I said, if you're a girl, you need an Aaron with an E and a her, H-E-R. See, guys need an Aaron and a her, and girls need an Aaron and a her. But that's the thing, is you need people. I heard, uh, who was it? John Corson, I think, say, we all need a kind of friend who could put us away for 30 years. And he meant it in the sense that you need someone that you just say everything to, every deep, dark secret, and it's great. And I have, you know, I've got Kyle, and I've got my friend Aaron in Ellensburg, and I have a couple men whom I know I can go to with anything. And they'll punch me, or they'll pray for me, or whatever they think I need. Kyle could use to pray more, I think, and less punching, but still. It's, you need an Aaron and a her. You need someone to hold up those hands that we have brothers and sisters who are there for us to uphold us, and that's something I know Cameron's the one who taught me, and most of, many of you know Cameron, who's now in Ellensburg, but uh, he learned it at a retreat, and I think a few of us went to a retreat where, spot me. The youth know this. Two words, spot me. It's a two-word text message that you send out to your little group And all they know is that you need prayer and you need it right now. You don't know what it's for. It doesn't matter what it's for. But you pray when they say spot me. And whether that's a temptation, whether that's a decision you have to make, we've got an Aaron, we've got a her. We have someone there to help us with this battle with the flesh as we seek God in intercession, as we fight the battle 
But notice it's not intercession alone. And if we look at verse 13, so Joshua defeated Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. And so it's that reminder too. It's the word and prayer powered by the Holy Spirit. I never could come up with a way to like to somehow make that our church's theme, but that's always been my heart ever since I've gotten here. It's those three things. That's the cores of what we believe. It's in the word. We are in prayer, empowered by the Holy Spirit. You need all three because the word of God is like a cannon that aims the shot. Prayer is the cannonball. It is what does the hitting and the force, and the true things change through that ball, and the gunpowder is the Holy Spirit. It powers the whole thing. You can have two of the three, but you're not going to have a functional cannon without all three. Being in the Word, being in prayer with the power of the Holy Spirit, the Word of God says that the, take the helmet of salvation, but it's also the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. For the Word of God, that was Ephesians 6, is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow and as a discerner of thoughts and intents of the heart. Hebrews 4.12. That was Ephesians 6.17. And here's Hebrews 4.12. The word of God is the sword. So he's down there fighting with the sword, and I don't think we can move through this without making mention of that. And now we come to the close. So we see this battle. It's one through prayer. It's through solemn prayer, passionate prayer. It was exhausting prayer. But Moses made intercession on behalf of his people. And when he interceded, the flesh was at bay. And when he quit interceding, the flesh, Amalek, began to be victorious. I don't know how many battles I've won because other people are praying for me not even my own faithfulness in prayer, but because of a grandmother or a blessed friend, old friend's mom, whoever it may be, praying for me. I just thought the other day, I'd be okay not being the smartest pastor or being the most popular pastor, the funniest pastor, or the whatever pastor, but I wouldn't mind the title of the most prayed for pastor. So if you all want to see what you could do about that, I, I wouldn't mind the title of most prayed for pastor. So... Pray for each other. And then look at these last three verses, because I actually think these last three verses is a whole other sermon in itself. But we're just going to take it on in a few minutes. The Lord said to Moses, write this for a memorial in the book and recount it in the hearing of Joshua. Okay? He tells him to write this down. This story is noteworthy. And this is more significant because here's the deal. That's the first time in the Bible that there's any reference to writing something down. Write this down, Moses. Now, I, I don't necessarily believe this necessarily is true, but I've heard people make the argument that the oldest book of the Bible, many say is Job, because Job took place in the middle of Exodus, and so Job was over before Exodus was over, if that, or sorry, ex Genesis, in the middle of Genesis, so Job was over before Genesis was over. So some people say Job was the first book written. We all know Genesis has the beginning, Bereshit bara Elohim, in the beginning God created, right, the heavens and the earth. So that's the beginning, but Moses doesn't write that down until later. Whether or not the people in Genesis, as we went through Genesis, we talked about where there could have been written tradition, there's a reference to a book, but nowhere does it explicitly state this was written down. This is the first thing that's ever said, write it down. Write this down. This is before the Ten Commandments, that's a few chapters away, before the Book of the Covenant, because this story was important for us to get and understand. Paul goes back to quote this chapter of the Old Testament because this was an important message for us to get. How do we deal with our flesh? We pray and we intercede hard and we do it consistently. We don't lag behind. We stay up with God and we stay near God on a regular basis. Write this down, he says. And then he says, I'll utterly blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven, and we'll come back to that. But in verse 15, Moses built an altar and called its name Yahweh Nisi or Jehovah Nisi. The Lord is my banner. Now, 
A banner back then was a little different than today. It actually wasn't a cloth thing. They actually would make these metal things on the top. But it was the same principle. Um, it's the same principle. And actually, I was going to put a picture up, but I forgot to tell Thomas to do the picture. Um, so that's not Thomas's fault. But William Harvey Carey has been attributed to be the first black man to ever win the Congressional Medal of Honor. I had a picture. I was going to bring it. He fought the Battle of Fort Wagner in 1863 in the Civil War. And many of you may be familiar with the old movie Glory, where um, it's about the first group of black men to put in to make a soldiers and have them all go fight together, and uh, they lose that battle. But this guy, William Harvey Carey, wins the Congressional Medal of Honor because, I mean, I'll look down so I get this right, he was shot in the face, both shoulders, the arms, and the legs. I think it was about seven shots. But he didn't let the American flag drop. The guy was killed. He ran up and got it, and he held it. He had already been shot once, so he had one bullet in him at the beginning, or one bullet had hit him. He gets that thing up, and he gets shot six more times holding the American flag, and he refused to let the flag drop. Why? Because in a battle, whether you've seen Glory or you've seen Braveheart or whatever movie with old battles, you know that those flags, that is what people look to. That was the rally point. That was the thing, you know. You start fighting, and all of a sudden you're like, I'm a long way from the flag. <laughs> Time to start fighting back this way now. You, you get near the flag. The flag would tell you what to do and where to go. And this guy, he kept getting shot. And people, there's, they're reading the quotes. It's a fun story to read about. Uh, just, you know, that he, no matter what, he didn't, he had bullets in him. I know, I think one they never removed, I believe, from what I was reading. Like, he had one stay in him for, for life. They couldn't get it out. But he, he gets given the Congressional Medal of Honor because he held that flag up so people could look to the flag, so people could know where to go, know what to do. And so when this battle is won, Moses builds an altar, and he says, the Lord is my banner. I look to the Lord. And as I imagine this, as I've told you guys before, I'm a movie guy. I like to imagine that I'm there and what did this look like? And all I know is, is as Moses is up there on the hill and his arms are tired and he wants to quit, if you looked across the valley on another hill, there was a rock split open that was pouring out water. And he could look to that rock and it can be remembered that God is with me. I can look at that rock and I can see it. I just know God will provide. God will get me through this. And he sat there and he, he held out his arms and he just hung in there looking to the rock. But then down in the valley is Joshua. And Joshua's fighting and he's fighting with the flesh. He's fighting with Amalek. And if he ever lost his hope, he could look up on a hill. And there's three men on a hill. And the guy in the middle's got his arms outstretched wide, making intercession for them. And there's the guy on the hill, and he looks to him. And I just see that picture, right, of Jesus on the cross at Calvary, the man on the left, the man on his right, his arms stretched wide. And yet you could even twist it another way because they brought him a rock to sit on. And it says that he's now sitting on the right hand of the Father. And what is he doing up there, our great high priest? He's continually making intercession for us, the Bible says, that Jesus is in heaven at this very moment, seated with God, making intercession for you and for me, interceding on our behalf. And so we might have to fight the battle of the flesh, but we are equipped with the tools. We can look to our Lord. We can get in the word. We can pray without ceasing and pray passionately, prayers of intercession. And this is the closing thought in verses 14 and 15. You see, the first thing to remember, sorry, 14 and 16, is in verse 16, it says the Lord says that we'll wage war with Amalek from generation to generation. This isn't a battle you're supposed to expect. When will it ever end? God tells you right here. The battle of the flesh, it's a continual battle. Expect it to go on. Know how to fight it. Know how to prepare yourself for it. But don't expect it to just disappear. It's a fight from generation to generation. But in verse 14, God did say, but one day I will utterly blot out the remembrance 
the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. That's blotting out the remembrance of the flesh. So let's close together. Let's flip to where the answers are in every book, right? To the back. We flip to the back because that's where they put the answers. Revelation 21, our closing text. I'll even start a few verses early. I was going to start uh, in verse 4, but I'll start in verse 1 so you guys can catch up. Now I saw the new heaven and new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. Now join with me in verse 4. Highlight it, box it, underline it. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain. For indeed, the former things have passed away. The flesh will come to an end. Every struggle you've ever struggled, it will be gone. It will be done with. And get this, I like broke down when I read this because I knew I was going to read verse 4. That was my plan, right? And then I read on because it says, He who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. Love it. And he said to me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. This is the last time in the Bible. Write that down. And I was blown away because the first time God says, write that down. It's about the battle of the flesh that we're going to endure in this life. The last thing ever written down in the Bible is it is faithful and it is true that this is going to come to an end. There will be no more tears. There will be more, no death, no sorrow, no crying, no more pain. It's all going to be gone, and I'm going to make everything new. That is our blessed hope when we think of Jesus coming back for us, that we get to look to this. And even though I battle with the flesh today, this is my promise that I can believe in. And he said to me in verse 6, it is done. I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give of the fountain of the water of life freely to him who thirsts. And there they were at the rock in Rephidim. They were thirsty. And God provided. And that's always been God's promise. If you come to me thirsty, I will give you drink. One of the last verses of the Bible, 2217, right? Spirit and the bride say, come. Let him who hears say, come. And let him who thirsts come. Whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. Let's pray. Lord, you are so good. You are amazing. Your love is never ending. And God, I just pray. I pray for every person here, Lord, that there's not one of us who does not wrestle with the flesh, who does not know the pain and the, the sorrow that, that the flesh can bring to us. And so, God, I just pray that you would give us strength. Father, give us strength to fight the flesh. Give us strength to have victory over the flesh, God. And Lord, if there is someone here today who's just got something in particular, a specific sin, a specific struggle or temptation, God, I pray you would deliver them from that, God, and that you would help them, that you would help them seek you daily, seek you regularly, God, to seek you in prayer and to let them pray without ceasing and that you would honor those prayers, God, and that we would just keep coming to you every day. And God, like your word says, let no man, oh, let, let, him, let him fall, God. Let we take heed 